We'll have a couple of things to do. The first thing is just to go through um, an example, talking about the multi-stage flash once through system. And then the other part, we're going to get into the multi-stage flash binary circulation, which is the spreaded uh, mode of MSF, which is found here in, in the kingdom as well as in the Gulf. So the example that, uh, that I have is actually, it's an example in the book. And it's talking about a multi-stage flash desalination system that has 24 stages that is producing 7.2 million gallons per day of uh, desalinated water. Uh, Seawater temperature as it enters is about 25 degrees centigrade. Steam temperature extracted from the power plant turbine is at 116 deg degrees centigrade. It is saturated vapor. It should increase the temperature of the seawater to a top brine temperature of 106 Celsius, whereas the rejected brine is at 40 degrees centigrade. The example is proposing using a heat capacity or a specific heat for the water to be 4.18 kilojoule per kilogram centigrade, a feed salinity of 42,000, And the vapor velocity in the last stage is six meters per second, whereas the brine mass flow rate per stage width is 180 kilogram per meter second. This is basically uh, to estimate uh, the size of, of the unit. And the coefficient of friction or coefficient of discharge for the wear as the flow of the brine moves from one stage to the other uh, is about 0 0.5. This is the CD. It is just like an orifice. If you, if you remember, we talked about reducing the pressure from one stage to the next one and reducing the pressure. One of the ways that it can be do, it can be done is by using what we call weirs. It is something like uh, the same idea of the Venturi or the orifice meter. The only difference is that it is uh, something like what happens in dams or uh, which is usually used by several engineering people. So, and we need to calculate the performance characteristics of this kind of system. So to begin with, what we need to do is to um, make a conversion of uh, units because the flow which is given, I'll just summarize the data that are provided Uh, Doctor, are you sharing the screen? No, not yet. I'm going to I'm going to share it now. Okay. And actually, I thought I would share uh, the white screen so that we can go through the solution as a step by step. I hope you can see it now. Yes, we can. So fine. So um, it's basically an example. And we are talking about a multi-stage flash once through system. The productivity M dot distillate is given as, um, yes, as I mentioned, it is 7.2 mega or million gallons per day. And this expression is common in, in desalination systems that have a large scale, talking about the productivity in million gallons per day. Um, steam temperature is 116 degrees centigrade, whereas the top brine temperature is 106 degrees centigrade. The number of stages is 24 for this layout. Let's get started by the information that we have. Definitely he's providing the value of CP as 4.2 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin or centigrade. Uh, what else is given as data for this problem? Some, uh, I mean, for, the, for this uh, values, yes, the value of TN Temperature of the rejected brine from the last stage is 
40 uh, degrees centigrade. And uh, the salinity of the feed is 42,000 ppm. Now let's start from here. The issue re regarding the, um, the, the physical dimensions of the plant, we can, get, we can get to a little bit later. Now to begin with, we need to work out with this so that we can convert it from a million gallons per day to kilogram per second. So M dot distillate is basically 7.2 into 10 to the power of six gallons per day. convert from a gallon to cubic meter, we are going to say that one cubic meter is equivalent to 219 to 19.96 gallon. So now we can get rid of the gallon. And we are talking about a day. So one day, is equivalent to 24 hours. Each hour is 3600 zero, zero seconds. So now we are going to have our, uh, our analysis in terms of cubic meter per day. And then into cubic meter is a ton. So into 10 to the power cube. So that this is kilogram per cubic meter. That will give us a value of 378.8 kilograms per second. So this is the mass flow rate. Uh, what else we shall need here? We shall need, we know the value of the CP, it's already given to us. And then we have the average temperature, which is T naught plus Tn divided by two, 106 plus 40 divided by two. So this is about 73 degrees centigrade. Why do we need the T average? Because the analysis, um, that we have done last time, assumed that we are going to calculate the value of the HFG at an average temperature. And the value of HFG in this case has been found, you can get that from the uh, thermodynamic tables or the EES or whatever. And the value is basically 2330.1. Joule per kilogram. Then, if you recall, we had defined a parameter that we called Y as. CP it was a ratio between sensible to latent heat so it's CP into delta T divided by HFG average so delta T is what we want delta T total is the Top brine temperature minus rejected brine temperature, which is 66. Delta T per stage is that 66 divided by the number of stages. So the, the value of delta T, which is the temperature uh, difference across 
every stage is going to be calculated and the value is 2.75 degrees centigrade. Accordingly, we can calculate the value of, of Y, CP is 4.2 multiplied by 275, uh, 2.75 divided by the value of 2330.1. And this gives a value of Y, which is equal to 4.9. into 10 to the power of minus three. And it's dimensionless. CP is kilo, kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin multiplied by a Kelvin. So it's kilojoule per kilogram and HFG is kilojoule per kilogram. The expression Y, we have used it in many occasions last time. Part of it is to relate the feed flow rate to the distillate flow rate. For example, M dot feed is equal M dot distillate divided by this relation, by the way, should be provided to you. You don't have to, uh, to memorize. One minus, one minus y to the power n. n is 24. This is the number of stages. y has been calculated right now. So from here, we can calculate the value of the feed flow rate for the plant. And the value is 3384. Point eight kilogram per second. So we have now the feed flow rate, which was basically based on the relation that has been developed throughout the derivation that we did last time and coming up with uh, this link between the feed flow rate and the distillate flow rate. We can calculate the, uh, the rejected uh, brine flow rate, for example, by using the same information that we had earlier, m dot f is equal to m dot b plus m dot d. From here, we can calculate m dot b, and then m dot feed x feed is m dot b xb and from here we can calculate the value of m dot of the rejected brine if we are asked to if we I mean if we are supposed to calculate this value which is four seven two nine three ppm approximately And this value is three zero zero six kilogram per second. We have calculated the value of delta T, we know it. Accordingly, the value of T1, which is the brine temperature leaving stage number one, is T naught minus delta T. T naught is 106 minus 2.75. So this is the temperature of the brine, which is leaving effect number one, 103.25 degrees centigrade. What we need basically is the temperature of the seawater before it enters the brine heater, which is a small T1. And T1, small t1, is Tf plus the number of stages into delta T. For you to remember, we had feed water coming here, m dot feed, 
at T feed and for the old for the OT for the once through system, the value of TF and T cooling water is the same because basically here's the sea water comes here from the sea and enters into that part right away and then it will go through different stages. So here we have stages. In every stage, its temperature decreases by delta T and we have n number of stages. So that's why the temperature here, which is T1, is this temperature plus n into delta T of every stage. And accordingly, this value of T1 can be calculated and it, you'll find that it is 91 degrees centigrade. This is significant. The seawater could increase from 25 degrees centigrade, which is Tf, and then N is equal to 24, and delta T is 2.75. So there's a significant increase in temperature. You see, this is the, the kind of energy recovery that we are talking about. You are generating vapor anyway, <clears throat> and you need to condense that vapor. So we make use of this latent heat of condensation to preheat the feed that has been preheated substantially from a value of 25 degrees centigrade to a value of 91. Now, after that, this temperature, T1, this flow is going to enter into the brine heater so that it will be heated from T1 to T0. How it will be heated? By steam, which is obtained from a power plant. So, T steam has been given as 116 degrees centigrade. And at this temperature, the value of HFG of steam can be calculated and the value of HFG of steam is basically F2, 2, 2, 2.3 kilojoule per kilogram. So that the energy balance for the brine heater is going to be M dot steam. We don't know this value, H, Fg of steam, we have just obtained it here. This is in balance with M dot feed. The feed enters here, Cp, and it will be heated from T1 to T0. Let's see, we have M dot feed, we have obtained it here. This is the value, 3384.8. Cp is given as 4.2. T0 is given to us in the problem as 106 degrees centigrade. And T1 has been calculated to be 91. So the only unknown in this equation here is the value of M dot S. Accordingly, M dot S can be calculated and its value is going to be 95.5 uh, kilogram, sorry, per second. Now we have the value of M dot steam and we have the value of the productivity. So we are in a position where we can calculate the PR of this plant performance ratio. PR is M dot distillate or M dot steam 378.8 divided by 95.5 and it will get us a performance ratio which is uh, let me see where this value is calculated uh, so that I do not have to get into the Don't use the calculator. I don't find it here. So maybe I have to use my calculator. Maybe maybe one can use his calculator and tell us. 3.96. 3.96. 96. So this is 3.96. This 
is give is this is basically going to give us a clue of how the performance actually in, in real uh, MSF once through systems, the numbers are slightly different than what we have here. And we can get like a PR of somewhere between five and six. Whereas if I'm going to have 24 stages in a, in a brine recirculation system, I may get a value of some, somewhere between nine and 10, which is, which is the maximum value that you can get currently from, uh, from the MSF technology. So this is the PR. Now, if we are thinking of calculating the areas, if I'm going to consider stage number one alone. So for stage number one, Oh, sorry, let's let's start by the, the brine heater. Since we have the information needed for the brine heater. For the brine heater, we have temperature of the steam. And we have the seawater temperature, which is being increasing. So this is T steam, and this is T1, and this is T naught. So here I'm talking about brine heater and in the brine heater already did made the balance here of this this is the this is the energy balance for the brine heater m dot steam into hfg of steam is m dot cp into t naught minus small t1 and then this q heater which is basically m dot steam into hfg of steam is going to equal to overall heat transfer coefficient in the brine heater into the surface area of the brine heater into the log mean temperature difference of the brine heater. So we have delta T1, which is Ts minus T1. Ts is 116, T1 is 91. Delta T2 is Ts minus T0. So the log mean temperature difference here is going to be delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by ln delta T1 over delta T2. And this value can be calculated. Having calculated the LMTD, the overall heat transfer coefficient should be given to us. Either it can be provided to us in the form of a polynomial, or it can be given to us as a value. So from here, the overall heat transfer coefficient can be given as two kilowatt per meter square centigrade. Now we have UB, we have LMTD, we have M dot steam, HFG steam. So from here, we can calculate the area for the brine heater, which is going to be 6481.7. So this is for the brine heater. There's nothing new in this piece of calculation for the area of the brine heater. Now we can calculate the area for the stages. The assumption is that all the stages are having the same area. So what you need to do is calculate the area of one of these stages and then multiply by the number of stages. So this is basically what we are doing right now by considering stage number one. For stage number one, in the top side where the tube where the tubes are located for condensing the vapor and reheating the feed this is stage number 1 where there is feed coming here and leaving this is coming with a temperature t2 and it's leaving with a temperature t1 t1 we have calculated as 91 degrees centigrade now T2 is going to be T1 minus delta T, which is 2.75. So this is 91 minus 2.75 degrees centigrade, and then you can calculate this value. Then in this stage, basically our Q is going to equal to D1, the vapor that is going to form here into HFG of the vapor. 
So we need to see how to calculate that. And then we have, again, the temperature profile in which we have vapor temperature, which is used to heat the feed from T2 to T1. So this is T vapor, which is T1, or let's say it's T naught minus boiling point elevation. So the boiling point elevation should be provided to us either, for example, it's one degree in the form of a value or it's given as a form of a polynomial. And then you will be go going to calculate the value of boiling point elevation based on temperature and salinity. And here we have the value of T2. Temperature is going to increase to T1. So this is T vapor one. So our delta T stage number one, delta T1 is TV1 minus T2. Delta T stage number one, two is TV1 minus T1. And then you can calculate the log mean temperature difference for this case. So log mean temperature difference is being calculated. However, we need the value of the heat transfer in, uh, in stage number one so that we need the value of D1. D1 is Y into M dot feet. This is a relation that we have developed last time. And this is a relation that you may keep on remembering. Where did, where did this come from, this relation? Actually, it came up or it came from the value that D1 into H F G of the vapor is M dot feed C P T naught minus T one. And we said that C P, which is C P into delta T. C P delta T divided by H F G is the value of Y. And from here, you can simply get the value of D1. Why we can calculate it? Why? We did that earlier. And the value of M dot feed we have calculated earlier. And accordingly, the value of D1 can be obtained right away, which is 16 0.7 kilogram per second. Q1 is D1 into HFG vapor that we have calculated before at the average temperature between 106 and 40. And we said that we are going to use a single value of the average overall uh, uh, latent heat of condensation of the vapor. So knowing the value of D1, then Q1 is going to be D1 into HFG. This value is going to be calculated and this is in balance with U1, A1 into LM TD1. U1 should be provided to you as well. It can be given either as a constant value or you will be having it as a function of, uh, of temperature, whatever, then you can sub just substitute and obtain this value. U, for example, is all also going to be considered as two kilowatt per meter square centigrade. We have the value of the log mean temperature difference. So the only unknown here is going to be the value of A1. Yes, Abdullah, uh, Dr. the first stage, it's always bigger than the other, right? In this case, we are going to assume that it is the same area everywhere. I mean, uh, real. Real, it should be bigger because the temperature is uh, higher. When the temperature is higher, you expect it to be lower, not, not higher. If, if, this, if Q is the same and you are using this relation, Okay. 
as the temperature drops, the value of the overall heat transfer coefficient drops and the log mean temperature difference drops. To keep Q the same, area needs to be increased. But if okay. we're talking about the case of mass production, normally they brought the areas to be the same. It's easier to manufacture stages that are identical in terms of areas. Okay. So practically speaking, for the MSF, they are basically using constant area. Now, based on that, the area is going to be calculated as almost 1,580. 1, and then we have the areas of one of the stages, we have the areas of the brine heater. So we are now in a position where we can calculate the specific heat transfer area, specific heat transfer area. In our case, it will be the area of the brine heater plus the total area of the uh, stages uh, divided by the flow rate of the distillate water which is being produced. So from here, we can say that specific heat transfer area is area of the brine heater plus number of stages, area of every stage. And this is divided by M dot distillate and the value can be calculated. So now we have uh, we can say that these are the heat transfer parameters that we needed for our calculations. And what we may get into now is dimensions with of every stage is m dot feed divided by Vb, which is the vapor velocity. We have been given the value of m dot feed here as uh, we calculated it actually as 3384.8. And we have been given the value of Vb as 180. This is the velocity per width. From here, you can calculate the width of the stage as 18. 0.8 meter. For the last stage, we were given the vapor, uh, uh, definitely the value of D24 can be calculated. We have seen the recurrence relation that, that can give us the value of di or the distillate at any stage. We have seen that last time. And um, we can get back, um, I cannot recall that, I don't memorize the equations. Normally I do, uh, I do derive it as, um, as we are moving on. are given the value of D24, we are given the value of rho V at stage number 24. Then we can use the expression that we have as the length of the stage is nothing but the flow rate. Remember that M dot CP is equal to rho V into C. So here we have to have rho, um, rho v into the area. So rho vn is here. And the velocity in that stage is given to us as six meters per second, velocity of the vapor at the last stage. And this is into the width of the stage that we have calculated now. So from here, we can calculate the length of the stage, which is about 2.6 meters. So every stage is 18.8 in width and 2.6 meters in length. What we may calculate after that is the gate height. 
and the brine pool height. And for this, there are equations that are provided to us so that what we have to do is just substitute directly in the equations that are given for, we have like an empirical formula that provides us the, the gate height. I'm going to write this in a while. So basically what we see is some sort of a standard or typical steps that we can do for a problem to go from one value to the other. And the gate height is basically given as um, m dot feed into two row delta p m dot feed row delta p per stage, I mean. all to the power minus half. This is all divided by um, CD into the width. M dot feed is a value that we know already. Rho is known. And then the pressure difference can be calculated. We are talking about a pressure difference, say, across stage number one. So in stage number one, we know that the seawater enters at T node and then it leaves at the value of T1. So from here, we can calculate the saturation pressure corresponding to T0, the saturation pressure corresponding to T1, and the difference between them is basically the value of delta P, which is the value to be substituted in this part here. So if you have like thermodynamic tables, or easier, if you have the ES operating, then all you have to do simply is just get the difference between these two pressures. And from this point, you can calculate the gate height, which happens to be 0 0.078 meters. Then the brine pool height, going to be the gate height plus 0 0.2, so it's 0 0.278 meters. Now by this we have basically calculated all the required uh, information that are related to the main characteristics of this stage, of this, of this plant. Uh, this is according to what's needed in the example, but if you need it to go more and more in terms of details, we are going to use that if you remember the recurrence relations that we have considered last time. For example, you can calculate the gate height of every stage, you can calculate the productivity for every stage and so on. So that's something. Uh, which can be done. Um, I would recall the, the presentation I shared with you last time. And this presentation is basically having this kind of table. Let me, uh, let me share a file with you, which has this kind of, um, of, of this detailed calculation. And that can be taken from um, share. This is the one. This one has all the information that you have here. We have calculated some of these values ourselves, and some of them are going to be calculated accordingly. 
So this is one which is nothing but y y into m dot three And this is just plus 16.53, it will be 49.84. Plus 16.45, it will be 6.6.3, 6 and so on until the end. And B is nothing but M dot minus this accumulated value. So that it will tell me, for example, the brine which is leaving stage number 10 is M dot feed minus this 163.3, which is the accumulated distillate in the previous stages. X is obtained from the value that M dot feed into X feed is equal to B, which is the brine leaving a certain stage, multiplied by its salinity. And hence, you can get the salinity this way. You have X dot X feed, M dot feed, and you have brine leaving one stage. So from that balance, you can get the distillate, you can get the salinity of the distillate leaving that stage. Temperature, we started by the top brine temperature, 106, and then you are going to reduce 2.75 in every stage. So the difference between each one of these values is 2.5. The seawater enters at 25 degrees centigrade. After it passes stage number 24, it will increase by 2.75. So it is 27.75. And then it will increase by 2.75 again to be 30.5 and so on until we reach the value of T1 of 91. Gate height is going to be calculated based on the equation that we have written. You, you can do it in a loop, and then you can calculate how the gate height is going to change from one stage to the other. And the height is nothing but the gate height plus 0 0.2. So based on this, a small um, ES program can be written where you can put this kind of equations, and you can put all the values, or you can calculate a table like that easily from this kind of a loop. So the process is, um, it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but it's a standard process. A step-by-step -step you would go through and then you can get the values that you are looking for. Any questions? Yes, Victor. Yes. Regarding the gate height uh, that we have calculated uh, two seconds ago, uh, this is was the average, right? It's not for each uh, student. Okay. No, no. The one that we calculated was for the first one. Okay. If if you remember, we calculated, for example, how the pressure is changing between effect number one and effect number two, which I is T one, the saturation temperature at T one minus the saturation temperature at T two. The saturation pressure at the given temperature, T1, and the saturation pressure at T2. And then we could calculate the value of delta P for the effect number one. And so on. So this is basically what we have done. Let me see if the screen is still there. Uh, yes, it's still here. You can see here, M dot feed, this is what is entering the stage uh, one. Stage two, what will enter is not M dot feed, but it will be basically B1. For example, let me, let me put an example here. If I need to calculate the gate height, this is gate height one. If I need to calculate gate height two, what is going to enter? It will not be M dot feed. But basically what is going to enter is B1. Why B1? Because this is M dot feed minus the quantity of vapor that has left in stage number one. So the seawater that will enter stage number two is going to be less. 
and then you can assume the density is constant. Uh, you can even assume that delta P is constant. It's, it is not necessarily the case, but you can assume that. And then CDW, if everything is constant, but this value keeps on decreasing, then the value of the gate height is going to change. And this is why the gate height is changing from one, if one stage to the other. Did I answer your question? Yes, Dr. now it's clear. So for, for yeah. only for the first one, we're, we're considering uh, the mass flow, uh, the flow rate, the feed flow basically, rate. Basically, yes, basically it's it's how the flow rate is changing from one to the other. Okay. So for example, if, if, we, if we consider, uh, let's say that the third, uh, the third stage, then the will take uh, prime uh, P2, right? Exactly. So if you, if, for example, if you want to generalize it, you can put it this way. I can say that general get high get height i is equal to b i minus one, and the rest would be the same. For example, so get height for stage number ten would be the brine leaving stage number nine multiplied by this value, and hence you can calculate the value of gate height. And that would be easy if you want to put it in a loop, for example, in, in a program, and then it will be calculating it for you uh, automatically. Or if you know, you can even do it in Excel if you wish. Is that clear? Clear, thank you so much. Any other questions, Yashabab? Uh, Dr. Daltabi is considered constant or? What is it? Delta B. You may do that. Uh, actually, we said that the delta T is constant, didn't we? Yes. Accordingly, the value of delta P can be looked at constant. The relation between the, between uh, temperature and pressure is not really linear. But remember that what we are doing here is some sort of an approximate solution. So you can continue that. If you want to be specific, if you are talking about writing this in a program, what I would do, I would calculate what is the pressure corresponding to each temperature, and then I can calculate delta P accurately. But if I'm doing hand calculations, then I may consider it as almost constant. Okay. For example, say that, uh, uh, let me clear all the drawings here. Say that I need to calculate, uh, for example, I have, I'm creating a table where I have the value of T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on. So in that table, I can get the corresponding saturation pressure for each one of them. And then if I have P1, and P2, so delta P1 is basically P1 minus P2. And then I have four and five, so delta P5, what will be P4 minus P5 and so on. So that you can get delta P corresponding to every one of the stages. This is if you need to do it in all in details and you are sitting and doing it at the homework, for example, then that's something that you can do. Because all you have to do is go to the ES and use that formula that P saturation of I is equal to P sat, for example, of steam, with temperature is equal to T I. And then you are talking about for I equal one to n, which is 24, and then next, something like this. And then you can, you can create all the pressures that you want here in, uh, in a loop, or even you can do something uh, further by, for example, coming here and writing that delta P i is P i plus one minus P, uh, actually, if you are going to write it inside the ES, then you are going to write it this way. So it will be P I plus one minus, nine minus P I, and then you are going to continue the loop or next. 
So if you are going to write a loop like this, then you can, you can write delta P for every one of them, provided that you have all the temperatures, because I'm talking about Ti. So all the temperatures should be known to you, which means that, again, you would come um, at, uh, at an earlier step here and say, for example, that T naught is 106 degrees centigrade, and then T I, so this is four I, um, actually it's not four, four is what's, uh, what's being done in, uh, in the Fortran, but in the ES, what you do simply is duplicate. I equal one to N, for example, and then T I is T naught minus I into delta T. So that T one is T naught minus delta T, T two is T naught minus two delta T, T five is T naught minus five delta T, and so on. So you can calculate the temperature at any stage. You can calculate the corresponding saturation pressure, and then you can calculate the pressure difference. Then if you wish, while you are inside the loop here, you can calculate delta, delta T uh, or the gate height for each one of them. You can even expand that loop so that you can say, for example, that um, BI is M dot feed, BI is M dot feed minus I into TI. And then you can calculate, uh, uh, di is not the same. No, you are not going to make it i, I minus di. You are going to do it step by step. Like um, uh, it will be um, actually b1 is going to be m dot feed minus d1. So here you are going to put some sort of a summation. If you don't recall the summation as I don't recall it now, all I have to do is just get into the help of the ES and see how to do the summations because this should be summation of the DIs from I equal one to I equal I. And then you can put it this way. So it's not, it's not I into DI as you can see it here. It's a summation. For example, if I need to say, I need the value of B5, it will be M dot feet minus D, uh, D1 minus D2 minus D3 minus D4. So uh, this D1, D2, D3, D4 is, is better placed into a summation. How the summation is going to be done, you can, you can just look at the help of ES and it will tell you how to do it. And then you can get your whole table that you have seen inside a duplicate loop like this, where it will calculate everything to you. Now, what we need to look at is, we have seen the drawbacks of the single stage system. And the single stage system has this problem of, um, let me see here that I would share this. Yes, the single stage has issues. One of them is that you are going to use lots of chemicals because the, the, uh, the, the one through system, you are going to use much chemicals because as the fluid gets in, it is pre-treated by adding chemicals into it. It will be preheated and then it will go to the brine heater to be heated to the top temperature. And then it will flash from one stage to the other. And at the, at the end, you are going to throw it away. The example that we have a while ago, we needed 300, about 380 kilograms per second. To do that, you had to use something like 3,800 kilograms per second. And then you are going to throw, to throw away 3,005 kilograms per second. This 3,005 3, kilograms per second is already treated. So you are going to throw a substantial amount of chemicals to the surrounding. And this is not what you want to do because you have, you have already made an investment in these chemicals. So what would be better to do is to make use of it. And this is why the idea of the multi-stage flash 
brine recirculation comes into the picture so that it can take care of this by recirculating the brine, not throwing it away as what happens in the once through system. So we are adding what we call a heat rejection section so that what is the target is to reduce the issue of pretreatment that we want. You are, going, you are not going to pretreat all the water which is needed here, but only a part of it. And the rest is going to be recirculated again through the system. It's going to solve this one problem. The second problem that it will solve is that it will not be affected by the seasonal variations in temperature. Temperature in the summer is 30, temperature in the winter is 15. If this is the case, you can try this on a once through system and see the performance of the unit is going to change from summer to winter. This is not what you want to happen unless, as I said last time, you can use a heat exchanger to preheat the feed by the brine which is being rejected. But you are rejected brine at 40 degrees centigrade and the feed is coming at something like 15 to 25. So we're talking about a large area of the heat exchanger. So it's, it's, it's a, a, another investment that has to be done there. Maybe this all can be saved by using recirculation of the brine. Is it coming for free? No, because when you circulate the brine, then you are talking about a recirculation pump, which is going to be huge and it's going to consume lots of power. Now the issue talking about, shall I use a single stage as a heat rejection section or more? This slide answers this. Now, what will happen? You are going to bring seawater from the sea at temperature T cooling water, and this is going to enter here into a stage, a heat rejection stage, where it's going to be preheated from T cooling water to T N. And then you are going to take it here at T N, Part of it will be rejected to the sea, and the rest you are going to recirculate back to your system. So you are going to recirculate it back to the last effect. Note that the temperature which is entering here is entering at a temperature N. So basically, you have heated the seawater into Tn. How are you going to heat it? you are basically going to heat it by the vapor which is rising here. But the vapor which is rising here is raised at a temperature TV. This TV is basically TN minus boiling point elevation. So how can you increase the temperature from T cooling water to TN using vapor which is less than TN? This is not happening. This is what we call temperature cross. And this is what you see here in this figure. I have here fluid entering at a temperature T n minus J. And it is going to cool down from T n minus J to T n due to flashing. And then the vapor that will rise, it will rise at a temperature T n minus boiling point elevation, which is this. So I cannot use this temperature to increase this from T cooling water to T n. This is not going to work. So I have a problem here that a system in the way that we are seeing in front of us is not going to work. So what is the solution? The solution is not to have a single stage as a heat rejection stage, but to have more. So here what we have in this system, we have two stages. So that you are getting the temperature here of tea cooling water, and then you are going to increase it to T N here. Now, let's look at this. And uh, actually uh, the norm or normally what you do, you are going to consider basically uh, three stages as uh, this is the standard now in the industry, uh, three stages at heat, heat rejection stages. Then let's look at the profile. What would happen here? Not sure if I'm putting it in a figure or not. It seems not. But basically, 
when you consider here the temperatures, what would happen? Now, the temperature here, say it's T N minus J, for our case, J is equal to two. Then we're talking about a temperature of the seawater coming to be 25 degrees centigrade and say the value of Tn is 40 degrees centigrade. You are going to increase the temperature from 25 to 40, which is here. Constant increment, right, Dixon? Excuse me? Constant increment. And, uh, yes, we have a constant increment, exactly. So the temperature difference across this part is not the same as the temperature difference across this part. So from, from here to here, we have a temperature difference, which is not the same as the temperature difference as used to be here. And this is the key. When you need to do this kind of heating, you are going to do it this way. You have two stages here. You have a vapor temperature here, and you have a vapor temperature here, which is less. And then right here, you are going to have an increase of temperature like this, and then another increase of temperature like this. So that is basically the key when you operate a system like that, so that we can avoid this issue of having this kind of temperature cross. So the temperature cross is being avoided by having this kind of distribution of the stages into multiple stages. It's not a single stage, but multiple stages. Accordingly, you are not going to heat it in that stage from 25 to 40, but probably are going to heat it from 25 to 30. So when you are talking about a Tn here, 40, then the temperature of the vapor is going to be something like 38. And 38 is good enough to increase the temperature from 25 to 30. The temperature here is going to be something like 43. And 43 is good enough to increase the temperature from 30 to a temperature of 40 because the temperature difference is, or this vapor temperature is higher than both. So we are not going to experience this kind of temperature cross when you increase the number of stages. Here we have two stages, but typically what we have in the industry is three stages. Actually, when you look at most of the recent MSF plants, which are located in Jubail, you will find that there are two sections. This is what we call heat recovery section. And then here we have heat rejection section. In the heat recovery section, now, as of the latest unit, we have 16 stages. And the heat rejection section, we have three stages. So basically, we have a total of 19 stages, 16 plus three. The previous versions of the MSF plants they used to have 19 plus three. So that a total of 22. But currently, Al-Jubail Al Al 2, for example, Al-Khobar 2 are having that 16 and three which is typically the standard in MSF technology at the moment. So now, why do we have more than one stage for the heat rejection section? The answer is to avoid the temperature cross that may occur if we used only a single stage. And while answering this, we can make a plot like this one corresponding to a single stage heat rejection just to indicate the problem that we have. The TV is responsible of heating the cooling water. It cannot increase it to more than its value. So basically it's going to increase it only to a smaller temperature. And then you are going to mix seawater at lower temperature with the seawater at higher temperature here. What's the problem of doing that? What if the temperature coming here is, this one is 40 here, but this one is 35. What's the problem? The problem is that this mixing is going to result in entropy generation. Entropy generation is one of the problems that we need to avoid as much as we can when we are operating a multi-stage flash desalination system. So to avoid that, this temperature here has to be 
at the same value of Tn. So we cannot bring a lower temperature here to be mixing, but mixing should be occurring at constant temperature. Accordingly, we avoid the loss of exergy, which is associated with entropy generation. Is this point clear? Because it's important. This is one of the main reasons why we are going through binary um, um, circulation and avoiding the drawback of uh, temperature cross that would occur in the last stage. So that the standard is the number of heat rejection stages is three. Now, other than that, what is going to happen in a system is simply you have seawater coming. The seawater, let me use it in a clear, in a clear figure. The seawater which is coming here, it's going to be preheated in the last stage, in the following stage, and the following stage, where it will be heated from T cooling water to T feed. T feed here is equal to Tn. And then that feed is going to be recirculated back. So part of it is going to be thrown away to the sea that we don't want. And the rest is going to be taken here to be recirculated back to the last stage. So what we're entering in the last stage basically is our M dot feed. And the M dot feed here is going to enter into stage number 24 to compensate for that for a couple of things. We have to, to throw away some brine because this brine is of high salinity and we need to control the salinity. This is why we are doing this mix. So we are throwing away brine at a salinity of say 70,000 ppm and we are increasing a little amount of the feed at a quantity of 42,000 ppm thrown away 70,000 70, and bringing in 42,000. So definitely the salinity that's going to result in 24 will be less. It will be some, some, somewhere in the 60s where you are going to take this and you are going to make it enter into the heat rejection section and do the rest. So from this part onward, this is very much the same as the one through system. It's exactly. The only difference is that the mass flow rate here is what we are going to call as MR, recirculated mass flow rate. So we don't use M dot feed here in this part, but we use MR. And this section here is, in principle, it is the same sec it's the same operation of every one of these stages, but we do this, this sort of mixing. M dot feed plus M dot cooling water comes in here. It will condense the vapor that will form of any one of these stages. And then we are going to throw away the part which is not needed. And the compensation part, which is M dot feed, is going to enter here. Now, what should be the value of M dot feed? It should be compensating for what? I have a certain quantity of M dot R entering here, isn't it? which is entering here to be heated to the top brine temperature. And then it will enter in every stage. In every stage, it is going to lose some vapor by flashing. And so on. Until D21. So this is D19, this is D20, and this is D21, D22, D23, and D24. This is the vapor that is going to be condensed here and it will be leaving as a product. The M dot feed should compensate both of these, should compensate this quantity which is thrown away and the distillate that we are getting here as a product. So what you will find at the end that is that M dot feed is equal to M dot rejected brine plus M dot distillate, which is sigma D from one to 24. Isn't it the same expression that you have taken in the single effect evaporation, multi-effect evaporation? Even for the multi-stage flash, single uh, stage and multi-stage flash runs through. Now also for this quantity. So M dot feed here is equal to M dot B plus M dot D, but we know that what is circulating in the plant is not M dot feed. It is basically more, it is M dot R. 
So this is the quantity of feed that needs to be recirculated here. It needs to be joining the lost effect to compensate for what we have lost. We have lost brine, which were thrown away to keep the salinity balanced at a lower value and to compensate for the product that we have obtained so that we have the same value of M dot R recirculating through the unit. So this is basically some sort of a simple mass balance for the heat rejection section. In terms of analysis, we're going to, to see it next time in our next class that it is basically the same kind of analysis that we did earlier. We're only going to change some terms. Instead of M dot feed, we're going to use M dot R. And then we're going to look at specifically at what's happening here in terms of mass and energy balance, because there's going to be some sort of a difference compared with the one through system that we had earlier. Uh, this is it for today. Now the, the time is up now. And uh, remember in our next class, there are a couple of things that we're going to do. We're going to continue this, uh, the analysis for the MSF brine recirculation system. And we have also a quiz. The quiz is about uh, multi-effect desalination. You have homework number four in your hand now. It's, I think it was three problems related to MED. And the quiz is going to be somewhere close to this, uh, to this part of, of the course, talking about MED. So this is all going to be on Sunday, inshallah. Questions? Monday, you mean? We leave now, if you like, the time is up. And if somebody has questions, then again, I'm, I'll be staying for a while to take questions. Uh, uh, did you upload the uh, MED uh, videos in YouTube? Again? Uh, I need to check that, uh, yeah, the wood. I, I, I'll check it now. If, if it's not there, I would just, I'm taking a note now, I'm writing. They, they are not there. Doctor. They are not there, so I'll, I'll make sure that now they, I'll, I'll upload them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Doctor. Yes. I have a question uh, regarding the project. Okay, for the project, uh, Probably we need to meet separately so that we can discuss it. Um, today I have an appointment, uh, so at one o'clock I will not be able to be there. So maybe that's something that we can check um, later today or earlier. For example, um, what about at 10.30 if you wish? If I you have a quiz. That time. Oh, you have a quiz. Fine. So let's let's make it today. For example, at um, will seven o'clock be okay? Seven p.m. Seven p.m. Okay, that's great. Fine. That's right. that's okay, doctor. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, doctor. It's further, Sultan. Regarding just a question about like the project. Uh, mm -hmm. is is it okay like if we finished before uh, the deadline and we submitted it uh, to you to check it maybe or? Yes, uh, why not? You can submit it to me tomorrow if you wish. I have no problem with this. The earlier, the better. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, so I know, so I know you can... that you need you need me just to check it and then you can continue if something is not right. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect, perfect. Okay. Okay. Just uh, quick, so on, on Sunday is the uh, homework and... No, the homework is on, yeah, Sunday, uh, I said the homework should be Saturday so that I would uh, post the solution on Sunday. So Saturday, anytime, so, and just post the homework because I need to make the solution f available for you before the quiz. So the quiz will be on Monday, right? That you, the quiz will be on Monday. So I was thinking that you can put your solutions on Saturday. Yeah. Or let's let's say Sunday at noon, 12 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that that's be better. better. This Fine. is better. Okay, okay. so we'll do that. Uh, after 12 o'clock Sunday, I'm not going to receive homework. And I'm going to post the solution. Inshallah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Inshallah. Okay, Shabbat.
دكتور وين از ذا ديدلاين فور ذا بروجكت؟ Uh, deadline for the project, uh, I did not write it. Mm, I didn't remember if 